Good evening or good morning to those of you joining from Asia. I'm Karen Eggleston, Director of the Asia Health Policy Program here at Stanford University's Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. Thank you for joining our final webinar of this academic year. Our theme is Aligning Incentives and Building Resilient Health Systems in Asia. Today, two experts share their views on the coup, the pandemic, and challenges for medical humanitarian response and public health system recovery in Myanmar. First, I'm delighted to welcome back to Stanford, if only virtually, Dr. Fifu Thinzan. She is a Burmese national, a medical doctor, an epidemiologist, and a health systems researcher. Dr. Dinza is a lecturer in the School of Public Health in the Lee Cushing Faculty of Medicine at the University of Hong Kong. She is also a member of the steering committee of the Science in Exile Initiative, which brings together at risk displaced and refugee scientists, along with like-minded organizations who work together to strengthen systems to support, protect, and integrate such affected scientists. Dr. Dinza's research interests are equity, health and education policies, Southeast Asian health systems, sexual and reproductive health, gender equality, poverty eradication, and human rights. Dr. Sinza is also a public health and policy consultant, giving technical advice to think tanks and non-governmental organizations. She was a visiting postdoctoral fellow at Stanford and is a valued co-author of mine. Dr. Sinza will first discuss how Myanmar's health workforce strives to respond to the deadly syndemic of the pandemic, the military coup and post-coup civil conflicts. She will also discuss how stakeholders are working together to try to mitigate the crisis and how a federal health system could be built to align incentives for effective collaboration among the ethnic health organizations, among others. And second, we are welcoming Dr. Nalin Tun to provide a grassroots medical humanitarian perspective on the crisis. He's a medical doctor with a master's in public policy from the National University of Singapore. He works as a program manager for a local organization that focuses on social cohesion and pluralism among diverse communities. In this role, he manages programs that help vulnerable communities in remote, hard to reach and conflict affected areas of Myanmar to get access to health services and provide financial assistance to injured civilians who need emergency referrals to private hospitals. He will present results of a mixed methods survey conducted last fall discussing how Myanmar professionals, including healthcare workers, are spearheading the civil disobedience movement, helping internally displaced people, and trying to address the healthcare needs of populations in conflict areas. So again, thank you both for joining us. And thank you for welcoming um, our experts today and asking your questions. Please type your questions in the Q&A as you listen to our experts' presentations. And then we'll have 15 to 20 minutes after their presentations to address your questions. Fifu, over to you. Thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, Karen, uh, Professor Eichelstam, I'm so honored to be a speaker in this webinar as a former uh, visiting, scho visiting scholar at Shorenstein Epoch, and I would like to say hello to all my old friends over there. I hope you all are well, and good, good morning, good evening, whoever joining this webinar. So please let me share my screen first. So thank you so much again, uh, Kiran, for your very kind introduction. And my topic is a deadly syndemic, how the coup and the pandemic collapsed Myanmar's health system. And then I will talk about a little bit on uh, stakeholder activities. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will describe the syndemic nature of the pandemic, the coup, and the post-coup civil conflicts in Myanmar, and the current health system situations, as well as the opportunities and challenges. So um, a syndemic is defined as a set of link health problems involving two or more afflictions interacting synergistically and contributing to exact burden of disease in a population. Syndemics happen when health related problems cluster by person, place or time. Actually, the coup or the conflicts are not diseases, but the way they interact to each other towards the pandemic and eventually on Myanmar's health system really sound like a syndemic. That's why I selected this term for this presentation.
Before I jump to jump into the uh, current situations, I would like to talk about uh, historical background of Myanmar's health system. Myanmar is a British colony, so Myanmar's health system is based on British model, and there are a lot of non-state parallel health systems in the country. Here, I highlighted the period from 1988 to 2011, which is a military regime. Due to the lack of government investment in health sector, as well as the restriction or IMD or provision of the health services, Myanmar's health system was ranked the second worst in terms of overall health system performance by the World Health Organization during this era. And Myanmar's maternal and infant mortality rates were the highest in the ASEAN region. After 2011 to 2021, we got a democratization period. I was in Stanford there looking at the Myanmar's health system transformation, and it is the beginning of political transformation and also meaningful health system reforms. There is also an ongoing peace process, and Myanmar got a lot of democratic progress during this 10 year uh, period. Unfortunately, in 2021, February 1, there was a military coup again. And sadly, it could be set as the worst time for any political instability because all of us in this world are fighting against a COVID-19 pandemic. So the COVID-19 started in 2019, and according to 2019 Global Health Security Index, Myanmar's health system is the least prepared in terms of the health system's readiness to deal with even a moderate-sized outbreak. But the civilian leaders and the people tried their best to cope with the COVID-19 first and second waves. In February 1, 2021, there was a military took over the country and the critics claimed that it was unconstitutional, not legitimate, not in line with international human rights standards. And to me, what is worst was it happened amid COVID-19 crisis. So there are a lot of people's demonstrations against the coup. This is the example. On 22nd February 2021, estimated 20 million people protested across the country, and there are tens of thousands of people joined the biggest rallies to oppose the military coup. Another notable event is the civil disobedience movement taken by the civil servants across the country. There are estimated 417,000 civil servants joining this CDM movement, and then 295,000 of them were dismissed or suspended from their position by the military, and at least 3,600 people are now warranted under the Section 505A of the Myanmar Penal Codes, and a lot of them are now hiding or migrating to the liberated areas, which is the presentation uh, given by, which will be the presentation given by my colleague, Dr. Nailin Tong. Another notable event is that the civilian-led national unity government was founded on 16 April 2021 to, to fight back the coup. And then another notable event of this spring revolution is what we call White Coat Alliance. In response to the coup, almost all public sector medical workers from 245 townships refused to work under the undemocratic military junta. But they are also a dilemma. Our duty as doctors is to prioritize care for our patients. But how can we do this under an unlawful, undemocratic, and oppressive military system? Dr. Zoiso published this in the Lancet, and he is now the Minister for Health in National Unity Government. So we also have questions, how Burmese doctors reconcile their obligations to their patients with their opposition to the coup and their commitment to democracy. 
In this photo, the doctor is saying that Myanmar is now in emergency. Please let us help the country first. So unfortunately, there are a lot of crackdowns being done by the military. And from February up to now, nonstop and escalating human rights violations are happening in my country. Up until now, there are over 1,600 individuals being killed. 12,500 people are arbitrarily arrested. And Myanmar's military coup also led to one of the biggest humanitarian disasters in history. There are 40 million people who are in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. The risk of disease outbreaks, including COVID-19, are increasing in these IDB camps. Unfortunately, there are several health system attacks happening in this country. Up until now, there are 415 incidents of health system attacks in my country. 286 health workers are now detained and are in jails. And then 30 health workers are being killed. Some of them are shot dead. And there are 128 medical facilities being attacked by the military. According to the World Health Organization, Myanmar became one of the most dangerous places for health workers on earth. So these are a few photos of the medical doctors and nurses being killed by the hunter. And this person is my dear senior surgeon, who I am very uh, adore of and respect. respect. And then not only that, there are hundreds of medical personnel being dismissed from their position. Actually, Myanmar was facing head workforce crisis since before the coup. Myanmar only had 16,000 medical doctors in 2019. Doctor population ratio was only 0.7 per thousand population, which is far lower than the World Health Organization's recommendation. Actually, Burmese doctors are working for the country with one of the lowest salaries in the world, which is estimated 200 US dollars per month. The workforces cannot be easily replaced and many of them are not warranted and a lot of doctors are currently hiding for their safety. This is a severe internal brain drain and I would also call it a brain hemorrhage. Many of the doctors are now migrated to the liberated areas and continue their services. And Dr. Nilin's presentation will mainly focus on their challenges. These photos are the dismissal letters of the doctors issued by the Hontralat Ministry. And I can't really see the logic behind these harsh interventions, no matter what the political ideologies could be. So let's get back to the syndemic effect. I would like to give the COVID-19 third wave in my country as an example of syndemic effect of all these activities. After February 1, the Ministry of Health led by the Hunter did not actually publish much data on COVID-19 testing and there was no new cases for a while. The COVID-19 immunization plans were severely interrupted and the leaders fighting against COVID-19 were detained or warranted, and there was no isolation, no quarantine, and no contact tracing or whatsoever. And then, unfortunately, the third wave started in July 2021. To be honest, there was no solid data to prove the effects, but this is just an example of uh, possible data being collected by a PhD student who is a Chin national. So these data are collected from the outbreaks, which has started in Chin State in July 2021. Case fatality rate was very high, which is almost half of total number of cases. So these incomplete data wouldn't give us no meaningful, wouldn't give us meaningful interpretation. Having said that, you can clearly see that the case fatality rate was super high and it is really worrisome. And instantly the outbreaks were spread to the populated areas like Yango and Mandalay. According to the United Nations News, 
the COVID-19 third wave has hit like a tsunami in Myanmar, and it is not an exaggeration at all. A lot of people infected by the COVID-19 and hospitals are not ready to accept them. And a lot of people passed away in their own homes. And there are a lot of oxygen shortages and a lot of crisis happening there. According to the Military Control Ministry of Health, there were a total of 4,500 COVID deaths being recorded from 14 July to 29 July, but actually a total of 13,177 deaths occurred during these two weeks. So where did I get these data from? So there are estimated 200 philanthropic organizations in Zhengou. We call it Prahita Organization. These organizations helped the dead bodies to transport to the mortuaries, and then volunteers recorded the data, and then they said that even though they didn't have any testing, 90% of dead bodies were with oxygen concentrators, and some of them reported that they calculated the usual extra deaths based on their regular numbers of deaths in the past. So these deaths were actually not officially recorded, but we can clearly see that a lot of people have lost their lives during the wave of COVID-19. And on social media, each of us has one family, family member lost and a lot of RIPs on our social media pages. And we could all remember that it is a time of a disaster. It is a time of a severe pandemic. Actually, to fight against such severe pandemic, what we needed was collective actions. But what Myanmar got was, in my opinion, collective trauma. It involved an entire society. There are a lot of social divisions, and the coup destroyed the reciprocal trust, both horizontally among the people, also vertically between people and the government. Actually, it could become even more deadly than COVID-19. Not only uncontrolled COVID-19 outbreaks, there could be enforcing regional and global impacts in the short time. Because Myanmar couldn't actually provide any effective disease control measures, so failures in these measures could lead to a lot of drug-resistant tuberculosis outbreak, drug-resistant resistant malaria cases, or even Facing preventable diseases could become as outbreak, and then there could also be other emerging infectious diseases, and Myanmar could become a reservoir for new COVID-19 strains also. So it shouldn't be taken very lightly, and also there is a lurking food insecurity and economic crisis in the country. There are also an escalating civil conflicts. These maps are a map showing uh, townships with at least one mine or improvised explosive device incidents during the last six months. And on the left side, it is before the coup. And on the right side, it is the first six months after the coup. So what is the current situation of Myanmar health system? So I would say that the leadership and governance of Myanmar's health system is totally uh, divided. So we could say that there are three types of governance systems in the country. One is the Ministry of Health being led by military social as SAC, and then one is being led by National Unity Government, and there are other ethnic health organizations in the liberated areas. When it comes to healthcare financing, it is really hard to do the analysis right now. I would say that there are uh, some funds for the military side, but National Unity Government is still struggling to get the recognition as well as a certain financing. And then ethnic health organizations, they do have their own financing mechanisms, but due to a lot of migrations into their areas, as well as because of the pandemic, they are also struggling in, in terms of finance. And when it comes to health workforce, I would say that a lot of Medicaid doctors are now working for the National Unity Government, and some of the Doctors are now migrated into the ethnic areas and working for some ethnic minority groups. 
a substantial amount remained in the military side, but the workforce is now divided that I wouldn't say that it is sufficient enough to give a uh, reasonable services anymore. When it comes to medical products, technologies, etc., the military control all the hospitals, all the medicines and technologies, and national unity government is trying their best to receive the medicines and technologies. Uh, ethnic health organizations, similarly as before, they have some kind of medicines products, but it is not sufficient. When it comes to information and research, I don't think any of these organizations could establish proper uh, surveys to understand the crisis, even though National Unity Government is conducting some surveys, and there are some small surveys in ethnic areas, like Dr. Nelintron surveys, which is our voluntary survey without having any fundings. We just feel obliged to do some research so that we could understand the situations and provide some policy feedback. When it comes to service delivery, I think military is controlling the public sector, but the services are limited because of the shortage of workforce in the military side. Majority of population had to rely on private sector, but the military has some suppressions over private sector. They want the public hospital not to appoint any CDM doctors or their license will be provoked. So it is a little bit difficult for the private sectors to, to work with insufficient workforce. And a lot of CDM doctors couldn't find job because of these suppressions. And National Unity Government is also trying to deliver telemedicine. According to their data, thousands of people get access to their information centers, and there are millions of people taking consultations during the COVID-19 outbreak. And there are some kind of health educations being established by National Unity Government. And also there are online education webinars going on for the medical students because the medical universities are now shut down and they could give some direct services, but I think it would be very limited because of the military suppression. And then in ethnic areas, the usual services will be continuing, but due to the overload of the immigrants, IDPs, and also because of the pandemic, I think their systems will be very much overwhelmed at the time being. So the National Unity Government and the ethnic health organizations are trying to make some collaboration aiming towards a federal health system. And a few of the ethnic areas were being covered by these organizations. In my opinion, the health system is kind of collapsed. So this is a time that we should focus on primary health care and also decentralization. Actually, we don't even need to do any decentralization anymore. Everything is fragmented and decentralized in a way, I would say, and health as a bridge to peace process. That concept should be adopted by all the organizations at the time, and we should start from the very scratch to aim for the inclusiveness and equity. So, even though these are some hope, there are a lot of challenges uh, lingering in rebuilding Myanmar's health system. Even before the coup, it was very difficult to get the very united federal health system because the situation is not actually post-conflicts. There are a lot of conflicts going on since many, many years ago, and there is a lack of trust even under the civilian government, because majority of the leadership positions were taken by the Burman ethnic group, and a lot of ethnic people still have distrust towards the Burmanization attitudes. And then the centralized nature of the Ministry of Health also deterred the other ethnic organizations to come forward for a federal health system. And there is a lack of EHOs community-based health organization workers accreditation, and also the national health plan itself is not implemented in some ethnic areas. So after the coup, the conflicts are escalating. And then Myanmar's ethnic tensions became softened after the coup. So critics say that this is a kind of silver lining 
We should grab this opportunity to build the peace, what I say, a real peace between the ethnic groups and Burmese majority people. And I, as I said before, there is no such thing as centralization anymore. So we should build better values at the time all collapsed. So a uh, federal health system uh, could be inclusive. And then I would say that this is a chance to build more collaboration between parallel systems to uh, establish meaningful, inclusive and HP. Uh, let me close this. OK, so there are also uh, challenges that Myanmar's health systems have to face has to face first health system attacks and the escalating conflicts and also very harsh political and military oppressions. I would also say that the social divisions in the health workforce as well. And there is a lack of finances and infrastructures from both sides. And then ongoing pandemic, it is also a very severe threat. There are a lot of uh, new strains coming up and we can't really predict the future of the pandemic yet. And the health system, even if everything else is removed, it cannot be converged or integrated until there is a peace accord, which is acceptable to all actors. So EHO wants a federal political system where the health system is devolved, equitable, and access accessible to all ethnic people. So when we talk about a federal health system, it is not only about the health sector, it is beyond health sector, it is a political process. And due to the coup, everything gets complicated, but we could simplify it. And then we could focus on national reconciliation first, and then work through all the hardships. So I would like to mention a bit about the stakeholder activities. Currently, the current stakeholders are trying to mitigate these crises and interact between each other. For example, the Federal Health Professional Council has been established on the 1st December 2021 under the leadership of civilian led national unity government and also the leadership of ethnic health organizations. The National Health Committee was formed by the representatives of the Ministry of Health and as well as leaders from the ethnic health organizations. And then there was a National Health Conference convened by the NUG and the ethnic health organizations. And the COVID-19 task force was founded again with the leaderships of ethnic organizations and NUG. And there was an establishment of ethics review committee, and they are trying to conduct some research to understand the crisis more professionally. And then I don't really have much data from the military led MOHS because they are not very transparent about their activities, but their position are very uh, harsh because ongoing oppression against the CDM medical workforce is now continued and then I would say that they don't see any positive signs to collaborate with any other organizations. So all the stakeholders are trying their best to continue medical training and education because the medical universities are now shut down for almost two years and the, the national unity government is collaborated with some ethnic organizations and they are trying to establish a medical science institute or is possible a federal university in a liberated area. This is at a proposal stage and I don't have much data on it. And then the Burmese medical dia diaspora like myself are giving online trainings, technical assistance, and seminars to the medical workforce, especially medical students, to continue their education. So we have to establish a new generation with new ideology and educational support from, from the international scholars, like scholars from Stanford. And that is one point that you could help the medical students in my country. And also there is a tally education system being established by a lot of stakeholders. So what's the position of international AIDS groups? Actually, their position is also very difficult. They have shattered access and ethical dilemmas. 
Should they stay or should they exist? How their money will be spent under the military's regime? Many aid groups within the country are actually staying very silent or they are delivering their services in a very cautious manner. And several international INGOs and UN agency declined to give interviews because they have several challenges. The first is the advocacy challenges. How could they advocate and how could they communicate with the hunter or NUG or anything? So there is a two track dilemma, also ethical dilemma concerning with the legitimacy of either party, or there is also high courts and high risk situation for their operations and the security of their people and the environment if lingering under the mistracks, also under the conflicts. So it is actually very tricky for them to work around these challenges. In my opinion, donors should not leave and they should try their best to, to adapt. And they should try to build greater flexibility and concrete contingency plans. And there should be a coordinated response strategy by all organ organizations and then critical services should continue so without their provisions a lot of people will be in crisis particularly in food and emergency health as well as COVID-19 responses. COVID-19 responses should be taken extra care because it could lead to an ending pandemic for the world for the whole world's population. So we should create flexible and political sensitive aid programs aiming towards the sensitive issues. And then we should also protect the medical workforce and create ways to give technical and education assistance to this particular group. So I would like to conclude that Myanmar's situation is being far from stable and Myanmar needs sufficient international attention and humanitarian assistance in all areas. And Myanmar's issues are not just tough or complicated. I would say they are wicked, but it doesn't mean that it's not doable. It is doable and we have to do this. And I would like to request international actors to be realistic about the limits of international leverage over the long term while giving the necessary assistance to the people. And last not least, Please don't forget the people of my country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I invite the listeners again to please put your questions in the Q&A. And now I invite Dr. Ney Leighton, please go ahead. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me for this uh, very important webinar. Uh, hi, uh, today I would like to present, uh, share the challenges for the medical humanitarian response in Myanmar. Uh, uh, since the coup, uh, uh, many people uh, uh, joined the protest and as a medical practitioners, we are covering as a medical, we are voluntarily committing as a medical cover uh, during the protest. Uh, after the uh, violence crackdown of the military to the protest, uh, many young people went away to the ethnic control areas for their safety. Uh, up at the ethnic control areas, uh, the, uh, the military also started fighting in these areas. That's why we also went to these areas for uh, emergency support to the people in need. Uh, uh, we also train the young people about the visit, uh, uh, visit first aid training because we understand that uh, most of the cause of that uh, because of uh, uncontrolled uh, bleeding. And uh, we also provide a visit, uh, visit needs uh, to the people. And then in the internet control areas, there are a lot of staff, uh, there, are st there are staff who join the civil disobedience movement. And then we organize the, uh, we organize the business, uh, business training to the medics. And uh, these are the same photos of the uh, business surgical skate trainings uh, to do the medics in these areas. Uh, in, in the in the ethnic control areas, the medics are the most functioning bodies, and they save many lives in the front line. Uh, 
uh, during our presence in the in these areas, we 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 talk with uh, uh, many peoples who went away from their cities to these areas, and then with their own concerns, uh, we interview some peoples, uh, some peoples about their challenges, uh, about their personal experience. Uh, uh, like members of parliament, CDN medical doctor, CDN soldier, CDN teachers, and political party members, and students and activists join our interview process. And then uh, uh, they shared that uh, they are attacked in demonstrations, and then uh, some witness that uh, a lot of people are killed in their cities in demonstrations. And then uh, even uh, they also shared that they, are, uh, they did not receive any uh, has services in case of emergency. And also uh, the San CDN staff uh, shared that they are pressure and threatened and not to do the CDNs. And, and also the same political members are mentioned that uh, they are warranted and that the police and soldier are destroying their properties and they share their, they share their experience. And for the future, uh, they also shared that, that the uh, CDN hacker workers, they, they want, they were, have a high intentions uh, to stop the uh, vulnerable communities in the ethnic control areas. And not only the teachers and doctors, but also the uh, uh, soldiers and from the military, they also joined the CDM movement. They shared that around 20% of the military person uh, in their institution, they want to leave and they are waiting for a good, uh, good timing and opportunity. And uh, uh, some shared that they are afraid to go back uh, to their uh, to, to, to their homes because the military were arrest and kill. And some people shared that they are depressed and then uh, they are like their future are stolen by the military. By, uh, by understanding on their challenges is that uh, we can we can we can deploy the uh, the response and like a support mechanism to these uh, to these vulnerable communities. We also do a uh, online survey uh, to do the CDN uh, CDN population as well. Uh, uh, we conduct uh, around out of the November and then around uh, uh, 1,885 participants joined this survey. And then this, uh, the findings are the perspective of these participants and not reflecting the whole uh, CDN population in the countries. And then with their own consent, we find that uh, the participants, uh, the participants, uh, came from different cities in, their, uh, in, in our countries. And then uh, the significant point is that uh, most of the city and population are young people like 18 to 30, 30 to 31 to 40. And uh, the point is that uh, not all the city and uh, staff are in the ethnic control areas. Majority of them are in their uh, original places. They are, they are like uh, living in fear and then they are suffering from the like uh, worries and like uh, and the threats uh, one day where we arrested or like kill and they living in the in the in the in the fear fear of uh, fear or worry and then uh, most of them respond that they are living separately with their family members and also even in the control even in the uh, people who can manage to. Uh, arrive in the stay in the ethnic control areas, but even uh, in this area, they are some they are fighting in these areas. And then uh, this number, uh, this number was calculated in the 2021 October, and this number increased uh, in the late 2021, and fighting uh, became more intense. And then in these ethnic areas, they. They experienced that uh, lama explosions, mortar shellings, and then in later 2021 and onwards, they suffer from the uh, like S A S strike bombings in 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 their in their uh, conflict affected areas. And they also people also donate our uh, contributions uh, to the CDN staff, and some of them uh, receive our uh, uh, CDN donations. Uh, most of the city and staff, they don't have any other side jobs, and then they have they have only have a government work. And then uh, most of them respond that uh, they cannot, they are not okay to find a new job uh, outside of a government job, because there are a lot of challenges in getting a new job. Because uh, uh, as the other few things of mentions, uh, uh, if a city and staff uh, no 
privates that are, are, are no privates that are recruit their CDN staff because the military bans uh, bans the private sector to recruit their CDN staff. And also, there are very few uh, vacancy announcement related to their uh, related to their experience. And also, they also weak in uh, scale how to apply a private job. As the main challenges for the CDM people, they are afraid to be arrested and then they are afraid to, be, to search in their houses and they are afraid to go out and afraid to do uh, some business. And then over around 90% of the people, they share that they have a depression and they are the insomnia and the other mental health symptoms. And then uh, for the the participants shared that uh, their, few, their hope is that uh, the people revolution will win within one to two years. But for the recovery, like uh, we be the country, it will take times, and then it will take uh, one to five years, five to 10 years to rebuild the countries. Uh, these are the findings from the like, uh, 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 affected, uh, affected communities and like CDN, uh, CDN populations. And then by understanding this, uh, we can, and as we can, we can deploy the best uh, how we can support these populations and how we can help each other. And for the like CDN, uh, for the healthcare teams in this ethnic control area, they also face a lot of challenging uh, challenges and they are working in the uh, sensitive and serious context. As you see in the photo, there are the uh, air, air bombings and then uh, on, the, on, on, on another photo, like the free medical teams that are facing uh, challenges in in, in, in the local areas. The, the three head teams are there, like they are trying to, uh, they, they are trying to save the patient with the available resources. Uh, they don't have any hospital, they don't have any clinics, uh, even no operation parameters. And they had to do the emergency operations and life-saving uh, procedure even in, at night under the torch light and uh, with uh, available, with the very limited resources. And as the main challenges on the ground, uh, they share that uh, very limited health resources and uh, health workers on the front line. And most of the uh, most of the healthcare workers are voluntarily committed to to staff the people in need and vulnerable community in the area where there there is no uh, like government health system or government health hospital or no uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, uh, located because of their remote and conflict in place. And also, they also shared that uh, uh, patient referred to the hospital is also challenging. Uh, like uh, it takes many hours uh, to bring the patients to the clinic uh, in the fighting uh, front line uh, until uh, they had to wait until uh, the fighting has stopped. And also along the way to hospital, the security and safety of the patient is very important because uh, on the way there are a lot of uh, military caves and chop white uh, on, on, on the way to hospitals. And uh, the most importantly is that the safety of the healthcare workers. Uh, uh, currently, the airstrike bombings and motor shell motor shelling uh, have uh, have been. Uh, happen in these areas and then it also destroy the clinics and hospitals and uh, that's why uh, as Dr. Pujutins have mentioned Myanmar becomes the most dangerous place for the healthcare workers. Uh, as the challenges for the patients uh, uh, the majority of people began the IDPs and then uh, they have suffering they have challenges in uh, food securities and also like injuries uh, injury by these uh, uh, fightings and also like and and con and controllable uh, non control like uh, non communicable diseases and also maternal and child health services uh, by by these by these challenges uh, they began uh, there there is an increased mortality and morbidity uh, in these areas and also most importantly the healthcare workers uh, worry that uh, lack of essential health services for example like immunization program for the children. Uh, there is no immunization for these uh, for the children, and then uh, the children don't have any protection from uh, vaccine protected diseases. And then the the healthcare workers are worried for uh, infectious disease outbreak in the future. And uh, the COVID nineteen uh, aligned with the COVID nineteen, there is no protected equipment and materials in in the on, on the grounds. Uh, that's why uh, uh, that's why the threat uh, they are living under threat of COVID nineteen and other infectious diseases as well. Uh, by understanding on their challenges, we are trying to 
we are trying to uh, go, we are trying to provide their their needs. And these are the sun photo what our from our activities on the ground. Uh, these are the basic hygiene gifts that we distributed to the IDB population around the uh, Thailand Myanmar area. And these are the sun photos of the IDBs. And then the uh, these are the sun photos from the health service provision at the IDB camps. And the hacker workers also shared that uh, there are increased number of people with disability in the areas because of the landmines and air bombings and motor shelling in these areas. And uh, for the mother, mother and child hacker services, uh, there, there is no uh, functioning uh, like a, a delivery room in, in the around the complete area. That's why we try to open a delivery room with their available hacker resources. And these are the same photo from the uh, labor room from Kitchen State. And these are the labor room, this is a labor room from the current state. And yeah, as, as, as last, uh, last but not least, uh, what we need on the ground is that the supply of emergency medicine on the on the front line, uh, because uh, the other the procurement and all the supply of medicines uh, to the complete areas are banned by the government, uh, banned by the militaries. That's why it faces a lot of challenges uh, for the vulnerable communities in the conflict affected area, especially like elderly populations and like chronic cases, and that it can lead to a lot of mortality and morbidity in, in the areas. And also, we also need uh, medical equipment uh, like uh, portable ultrasound and X-ray and also technical skills like uh, lab, uh, lab laboratory services. And uh, most importantly is the kind of protection to the healthcare workers. Like uh, we need to speak out for the, for the safety, uh, for the safety of the healthcare workers. Uh, these are my, these are my point. I uh, would like to share the uh, today webinar. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you both so much. You packed in a lot of information there about this very important and tragic situation. So um, we'll start with some of the questions that have come in. I will first ask, um, you had mentioned, maybe first start with uh, Dr. Sinza, you had talked about um, health as a bridge to peace and that related to many other parts of your presentation, but I wanted to invite you to elaborate a little bit more what you mean by that for our audience that may be less familiar with the situation even before the coup and what your proposition entails. Thank you so much, Karen, for this uh, point to clarify. Yes, uh, it is an important concept that we should adopt, especially in Myanmar, health as a piece help as a bridge to peace, because I didn't mention that Myanmar's civil war is one of the longest in the world. In fact, even before the coup, Myanmar was struggling with ethnic conflicts, and we need a lot of resolutions to make among each other. And then I see health as a chance to understand each other among the minority groups and with the majority Burmese groups. Due to the coup, the, a lot of Burmese from the central areas are now migrated to the ethnic areas and they came to understand the sufferings of the ethnic minorities. And then they could do a lot of uh, activities, especially medical doctors, by showing that Burmese people are not like the military people. Burmese people are also kind. Burmese doctors are also very good to them. In this case, the ethnic minorities who have been suffered in the remote area came to understand that it is not similar between the majority Burmese people and the military people. So they see Burmese and military people as the same in my country. So a lot of ethnic people misunderstood that majority of the Burmese people are suppressing them during the conflicts. Actually, now Burmese people also became suffered in the remote areas. And then we have this unity. We are in the same place. We are together. And then the military could be doing all the conflicts. And then by delivering health, meaningful communication, and then the, the 
The dialogue of peace, especially among head workers, ethnic organizations that could really improve the peace process after all the conflicts. So that's why I keep mentioning health as a bridge to peace as a very uh, meaningful tool, because I also would like to suggest that this kind of notion should be integrated in our medical education. In our medical science, we never learned about peace or conflicts. We only learn about science. We don't even understand the ethnic conflicts in our own country. So our education system doesn't give us enough chance to understand what is happening in our own country. And this is the time that we should change the whole situation. This is our opportunity to integrate peace and conflict resolution approaches in our education system. That's why I, I keep talking about uh, this ideology in my presentation. Thank you. Maybe to follow up with that, there's also a question thanking you for your excellent presentation. We know there's a limited data, as you mentioned, but there were two specific questions for you. Uh, what are the current coverage rates of COVID vaccination? Do we know first, second, any boosters? Um, there's some data out there uh, quoted here saying 43% of people with complete initial protocol. Is that accurate? Do we know? Uh, for me, I'm not in a position to say whether it is correct or not, because I couldn't actually get access to any data from the country, but I could assume that uh, a lot of areas might not have any immunization at all, but a few ethnic areas like one state, they have a kind of a, a liberated area in their own way and then 100% coverage rate, rate in this area. So some of the ethnic areas might have vaccine support from the international AIDS program, and then these area could be fulfilled to some extent. And then in central areas, as far as I know, the people had to take the vaccine from the private sector. So if you are wealthy, you might as well receive a few vaccinations up to three doses, but it is really hard to say the percentage of the whole population. So I think it is like the health system. It could be fragmented depending on the area and depending on your economic status. Thank you. Another question um, for both of you. Could you summarize how the resistant movement is going in Myanmar? Dr. Nate, do you would like to start? Yes. Yeah, the resistance movement is uh, like increasing in tensions. And then uh, in both sides, the military also like uh, increased attack to the internet control areas. And also the uh, NUG side and also like uh, people, uh, people defense force side, uh, people defense force, they also like increase their actions in this area. That's why uh, the tension uh, the tension and the momentum of the revolution became stronger and stronger uh, since the 2021. That is my own perspective that I have seen in, in within my countries. Yeah. Uh, from my side, I have two perspectives. So when we talk about resistance, there might be two parts. One is political resistance. Second, it's armed revolution, of course. So for armed revolution, there are a lot of pros and cons, and it is really hard to predict the um, situation at the time, time being, because Myanmar is always under some kind of conflicts in ethnic minority areas. But I would say that people are not giving up. So they are trying their best to continue revolution in any way. So. When it comes to armed revolution, it is ongoing and it is escalating, but which side is winning? It is so difficult to tell. And then I heard some news that even from the military personnel, from the military hunter, they also would like to leave the military and joining the uh, defense forces because it is 
really a frustrating situation fighting each other. And I don't know how long they could do that for a long time without having strong justifi justification for their actions. This is one part. So for the armed revolution, I don't really have any uh, comments. Uh, I'm not in the position. But for the political position, I think it is also uh, having some advance like uh, Dr. Zima Ah, she is also a Stanford alumni. She is now arriving in the United States and then will join the ASEAN conference. So it is acceptance from the, some international bodies towards the political parties of the national unity government. And they are doing their best to deliver the services, to give health education or any political uh, negotiations with ethnic organizations. In my opinion, if they keep doing that, the century long ethnic tensions could be relaxed rather than negotiations with the military themselves. But also, politics is also very complicated. So I don't really know where we are right now, but I think there are some advancement. And some of the countries like France, some of the countries like Czech Republic, they accepted national unity government as a gov I mean, kind of accepting their activities and their existence. So, and then again, no one is actually giving up. So if no one is giving up, I would say that it is advancing forward. Thank you. Um, related to something you just touched upon, um, but more at the grassroots level, we have a question. How can the international community support community-based organizations or ethnic health organizations in the country, given that they request registration, um, you know, or organizations, official bank accounts, et cetera, it may be complicated. Perhaps Dr. Nalington wanted to suggest some resources for the international community. Yes, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, currently the military like uh, regulate a lot of uh, regulate a lot of guidelines and then procedures for the CBOs and EHO, like uh, like uh, like bank credit bank account like regist bank accounts like uh, limitations and also like their registration process. Uh, the best answer to this question is that. Uh, is uh, yeah, it, it had a lot of challenges uh, to do uh, officially, uh, to do officially like supporting the EJ show and the CPUs on the ground. But there are a lot of multiple channels that we can contribute directly to the uh, fee on the ground, like uh, along with the uh, EJ show and CPUs. Yeah, they are, yeah. Uh, and starting on the public is that there are multiple channels that we can, we can support, we can support to the, uh, fee level, like for example, like uh, NUG, and then we, we there are a lot of like donation buttons, and then there are a lot of like options to to do a uh, fee activities or to implement or to support the uh, fee activities on, on the ground. Because the NUG government, they also have uh, a lot of clinics and uh, medical activities on the ground in different areas of the countries, and then it's okay to uh, collaborate with them. Yeah, and also like with the EA show, and like we can do a lot of informal or like multiple channels, how we can like, uh, how we can uh, support uh, uh, effectively on the ground. Yeah, but for the public, uh, public uh, answer is, but yeah, it's very difficult to answer, yeah. Yes, thank you. So um, maybe a question for Dr. Thinza, but you both feel free to answer um, a two-part question. Um, first, um, do we know if the military has suffered any COVID deaths? And could this bring some intramilitary resistance to the current leadership there? Um, and second, can you say more on the growing cooperation between the NUG and ethnic areas? For example, is it across all the ethnic areas? Um, and do you see it as a potential breakthrough given this long history that you've already been talking about if there's more cooperation? Thank you so much, Karen. So to answer to the first part, during the third wave of COVID-19, there are a lot of um, 
deaths and also uh, cases inside the military, but the data availability was not transparent at all. According to the telemedicine being delivered by the National Unity Government, there are a lot of military people asking for help through their tele channels. And then there are a lot of tele doctors delivering services to the family members of the military people because the military hospital did not accept the lower rank family members to their hospitals. So these lower rank family members of the soldiers had to contact the CDM doctors and ask for help. So I would say that without enough data, we could only guess that there could be a lot of cases inside the military compounds and a lot of deaths over there, but it is not documented and some of the deaths are labeled as other causes during the outbreak. So uh, we could only have some data from the telemedicine. So, um, the NUD telemedicine channel recorded the cases anonymously, of course, but we could see how many military person contacted through their channel to the doctors. Because we have very limited doctors and most of the doctors are CDM doctors and you have to turn to CDM doctors when in crisis, of course, if your military hospitals did not accept you. So that is one way we could find out the data. Uh, yeah, Dr. Nathan, feel free to add to that, or uh, there's some additional questions I'll invite you to. Um, one, just which geographic areas are liberated from the military junta control at the moment? And do you see the possibility of improving the health system and humanitarian assistance without collaboration with the junta? Yes, uh, uh, for the first questions, uh, the like separation of the uh, geographical area from the SAC control or ethnic uh, air control uh, at the current situation is uh, very difficult to highlight because the, the, uh, a lot of fightings are happening on the ground and then there is no clear margin or clear like uh, demar demarcations of what areas are the SAC and what area is the ethnic. But, uh, but around around the areas of the ethnic control areas uh, like they are they are trying to expand in their uh, their coverage yeah I, I can yeah I can uh, explain only for this yeah for, for this answer uh, and another question is that uh, uh, humanitarian services in in the SAC control area uh, without collaboration with Hunter. Yeah, uh, as Dr. Putin mentioned, a lot of CBOs and uh, like NGOs are working with cautiously, very high, like high cautiously, because it's a high risk and also a high cost. And one even, uh, uh, even, even uh, in, in everyday situations. That's why uh, all people, uh, their, their organization are trying to uh, continue their services uh, as much as they can, like very low profile and very like, uh, like they are trying to make with the full security measures in in, in the uh, in, in the uh, SAC control areas. They are continue to support. Yeah, they are continue to support the services. But uh, but for the uh, non uh, uh, non SAC control area, the humanitarian service and the needs of humanitarian service are really uh, really high uh, because the organizations cannot reach out. Uh, most of the organizations cannot reach out uh, to the front lines and then the, the needs on the ground are very high. Thank you. Yang, you uh, both had mentioned, but maybe Dr. Sinsai, since you talked about the telemedicine consultations, uh, there's a follow-up question about that. To what extent um, do we know that they're effective for different kinds of consultations? And particularly for those in rural and remote areas, of course, there are problems with the infrastructure. They may not have internet access. The price may be expensive otherwise. Can you talk about how to work around those issues? 
Yeah, this is a very good question. So, of course, the telemedicine cannot be assessed by the IDB people or people in the remote areas. They are facing different problems. The telemedicine is targeted towards the population in the central areas, especially from the cities. Uh, the cities also have poor communities, but they can access to telephones, internet, etc. So it is only targeted to the um, very uh, narrow size of the population. And then when we deliver the telemedicine services, again, there are a lot of dilemmas, whether we would be able to give the correct uh, diagnosis or correct treatment without seeing the patients. But uh, I talked to a physician during the COVID-19 outbreak because we were very concerned about the safety of the patients. And then he told me that uh, what they do was that they call each other, for example, the caretaker of the patient called the doctor and they do the video conferencing and then they look at the patients and then instruct the caretaker what to do. For example, oxygen generator, how to put it on, which is the good concentration level, etc. They instruct and then caretaker did it. And then he had an experience even teaching that caretaker how to inject a drug to the patient. So they are trying their best to overcome the challenges. And of course, there are dilemmas and consequences working out this way. What they would like to do is to come out and then build the camps and treat the patients openly. Even though they are CDMs, they would like to go to the private hospitals and treat the patient. And some of the doctors are trying to set up mobile clinics and then treat the patients openly, but it, it was not allowed. So it was really tricky for them. They are like criminals hiding and treating the patients and telecommunication is the only effective way during the COVID-19. And then a lot of the medical doctors are chased down and then arrested. So it is a kind of tricky situation. And some of the doctors would like to work for the private sector, like own GPs or private hospitals, but the military uh, give oppression towards the private sector not to hire the doctors. So the doctors' positions are in a very difficult situation. And then even though telemedicine has a lot of consequences and unforeseen uh, circumstances, they had to use it and they keep using it whenever the patients require them. And there are some data on their website, uh, NUG website, about how many patients, what are the cases, how many uh, telemedicine doctors are available, whether surgeon or pediatrician. Channels are there, data are there. If you are very interested in telemedicine conducted by the CDM, you could check these data online and could understand more on this issue. As from my side, uh, that's all I can share with you because I don't really look into the data yet. Thank you. So you both have described the dire situation in some detail. We have a questioner asking, particularly for healthcare providers, um, what would be your message to them about how to cope? Um, and I might add a question. Um, what do we know specifically that this Federal Health Professionals Council is doing? And do we have ideas about their actions, plans, and goals uh, near term and longer term? Oh, may I? So the first question is how to cope with these dire situations. So it is extremely difficult for them because a lot of my friends, my classmates, I have nearly 100 in my batch and then 99% or even 92 out of 100 of my classmates are CDM people. So they had to quit their job or they are hiding somewhere or doing something else. Some of them are selling other products not treating the patients because treating patient is so obvious that they are doctors and their safety is threatened. Some of them really migrated from the country. Some of them reached to the liberated areas. So it is mentally really depressing and challenging, not only professionally, but also life threatening. And no one would like to go to the jail and being in trouble. So it is like day to day pressure for them. So unless you are in the liberated area, the people 
in the central areas are more prone to danger. So some might be easy and then having a very re relaxing situation, but situation could vary. So I don't really uh, have any solutions for them to cope with this situation, but that's why we keep raising the issues to the international people to give the protection to the medical workers in my country. And then I don't really know because the, the situations are very difficult. We just wish that a military stop these harsh intervention targeting to the medical doctors. Then let them be, whatever their political inclination could be, let them be doctors, let them treat the patients. Don't arrest them anymore. Delete all the uh, warrants and let them be. That would be the best solution. And then the doctors, they really love to treat because they are doctors and they will come back to their even if they don't work under the junta, they will keep treating the patients and then the pressures on the health system will be relieved. So mentally, I don't really know. I just wish that all of my friends are well and healthy and safe and doing okay. That's all I could say. And uh, second part, I forgot your question. That is fine. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing there. Thank yes, uh, Dr. Nelinton, is there anything you would like to add about the position of medical providers? Yes, uh, as I in, in my presentations, I also shared that uh, uh, the the challenge of the uh, the CDN healthcare workers who are living in the cities. Uh, as you see in our in my survey, that uh, only a very few percentage of the CDN healthcare workers they can manage to stay. Uh, stay in the ethnic control areas and then provide the health service. And many, uh, many percentage, a large percentage of the CDM population are uh, stay in the, uh, stay in their, uh, in their original places, and then they are living in fear. And as Dr. Philippines mentioned, if they do the healthcare practice, and then they are sure they will be arrested, and then they will be, uh, they will be in jail with the many, uh, many penal codes. That's why for the like uh, safety and security of the of the healthcare workers, and also with the, uh, also in the uh, Dr. Philippines presentation, she mentioned that about the uh, ethical dilemma because uh, at the current situation, the the uh, the uh, the patient is the gun country, Myanmar, and uh, that's why the healthcare workers are trying to save the country first, and that uh, is a kind of like uh, uh, the dilemma between the like uh, healthcare workers uh, in the uh, who are joining the CDNs and uh, healthcare workers who are in the uh, SAC MOH side. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, there are several comments that thank you both for excellent presentations, by the way. Um, I also wanted to ask, you mentioned the COVID-19 task force and um, the dire situation and the lack of data. I'm curious whether there are specific steps put forward by that task force or exactly what they're proposing to work on. And related to that, perhaps you talked about the risk of additional disease outbreaks. Maybe you both could talk a little bit about whether data is coming back from the humanitarian assistance sites and other sites that can be systematically aggregated to have some kind of surveillance um, about potential new disease outbreaks. Thank you, Karen. That is a very important question. So does, uh, as far as I understand, the COVID-19 task force was established by the NUG and the ethnic organizations. The weakness with their task force is that they can only control the population in the ethnic areas. For the majority of the population under the military control, all they can do is giving health education, how they wash their hair, how they should wear the mask, or only moral and health education and telemedicine. So the, the ability to actually tackle the pan pandemic control is actually difficult for them. So it is a need that the military hunter also have to do some effective measures to control the pandemic by themselves. So without their actions, they are genuine actions to save the lives. The task force could only manage in 
very limited areas. That is one point that I see. For the data, like surveillance data, as far as I'm concerned, there are some COVID-19 regular survey being put up by the National Unity Government's website. So they are collecting uh, thousands of data every day. If you would like to put in the symptoms, they are currently co collecting the data. So I don't know uh, how the situation with the, these surveillance data, and even if they got the data, to do the contact tracing, to do the testing, these are actually beyond their control because the majority of the doctors are hiding, and these researchers are also doing these surveys when they are hiding. So it is a kind of complicated issues, and we don't know if the military hunter would utilize these data and use effectively to establish population, population measures against the pandemic. So that's why I said uh, the situation is quite wicked, and there is also ethical dilemma. For example, I'm an epidemiologist. I really want to contribute in the uh, COVID-19 control in my country, but should I collaborate with the military hunter? I would say no. It is a personal decision. There is no hatred or anything in that. I just don't want to. So it is actually the same situations for a lot of uh, epidemiologists and people across the country especially medical diaspora. We have no idea how should we contribute to our expertise to come up with a very good surveillance system so that our people are protected. Uh, only because it, there is a very strong ethical dilemma, we actually don't communicate with military uh, being led by the junta. So that's one point. And then for the task force, I really think that they are establ establishing some vaccination programs in the ethnic control areas. I heard that a lot of people are being vaccinated already in the liberated areas, uh, partially by the NUG, and major uh, vaccination programs are run by the ethnic organizations. So I would say that the situations in the liberated areas are safer compared to the poor communities in the city. That's what I understand. In the central areas, out-of-pocket health expenditure might be skyrocket by now. If you want your immunization, if you want to buy your mask, you must have money. Then you can get the immunization. I don't see any proper uh, vaccination programs being established by the hunter. Okay, okay, there are some, but the compliance by the people is also limited. The people didn't want to collaborate to the immunization program run by the military hunter again, so it delays their effectiveness. So it is a kind of very trust issue going on over there. So even if military hunter deliver a very sophisticated vaccine programs, a survey pointed out that a lot of people responded that they don't want to go to military hospital and take the vaccinations given by the hunter because they don't trust them. So it is so tricky and that's all I can share and that's all I understand. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Nailington, I don't know if you would like to add anything. We also have um, a final question that's commenting that there's very little coverage in the US and some other parts of the West of the ongoing situation there for many reasons, but it's a pity that this entire situation and crisis is just not in front of people's um, news and their understanding each day and may feel like they don't have a direct way to help or help to address it. The same way you were uh, expressing some dilemmas about what individuals can do and communities can do. So I wanted to part with a question to you both. Um, is there anything that gives you hope? What gives you hope? And what do you and you think that other young people, particularly students and others listening now, can do to bring hope to this difficult situation? Yeah, uh, I, will, I will answer first. Uh, yeah, in, in case of like uh, like uh, media presentation, uh, media presenting about the Myanmar, and also like uh, giving hope to the uh, to the young people. Yeah, aside of political uh, political interests, 
uh, there are a lot of challenges within the country about the like uh, communication issues. Uh, there are a lot of cities that are block internet connections. And then there are also a lot of like uh, a lot of address to the media person. That's why the flow of information within the country is very, very limited. That's why a lot of like global countries are like uh, not receiving the up to date news and what is happening in the countries in Myanmar and then even in the regional countries. They also don't know what the people, what the Myanmar people want. That's why we are like the Myanmar people are trying to speak out uh, to listen the voice of the Myanmar and then uh, how what we want for what we want for our future. That's why today even it also a kind of important webinar, important even to share what is happening, uh, what happening inside the countries. Yeah. And uh, for the second for the second question you mentioned uh, hope right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, can you repeat the second questions? Yeah, Kara, Karen, yes. I was just wondering what brings you hope and what do you think the international communities and particularly maybe are any young students are listening, what should bring them hope for the future for mm -hmm. your country? Yeah. Uh, uh, since uh, we uh, since we we are joining uh, uh, we are joining the like uh, support to the people, we feel that uh, we will we will do whatever we can. Even though the military have uh, uh, like limited a lot of regulations and uh, regulation and like bannings in, in in the areas, we are we have already decided uh, to to fight or to con to support the people uh, to the end. That's why our hope is that. Uh, uh, right now we already walk on, on the way and then we will walk uh, to the end. And then, yeah, we have hope and then we have a future. Yeah, until we, until we go away from the, uh, away from the process. Thank you for sharing. Dr. Tinsai, you have the final word, please. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for asking these important questions. And then it is understandable that the news about Myanmar are not actually uh, prevalent in the international front anymore because I noticed that at the same time there is Ethiopian crisis, then Afghanistan crisis, and now uh, Ukraine crisis, and the world is full of crisis. And it is really understandable that the news about Myanmar is kind of faint. And it is also very uh, understandable that the international people are in dilemma and what to do and how they should contribute to the good of the people. So uh, I would like to request the international people to support, especially technical. Uh, for me, that I am representing the health systems of the country and the medical students. So if there is any means that you could contribute to the future of the medical students, please do so by all means. A lot of medical doctors or students stopped their career and uh, education really completely and their future is lost. And that is one way that you can do. If you could deliver the tele-education or seminars to the medical students, please invite them. They'd be very happy. That is one point. And for the humanitarian assistance, it is also very complicated. And like Dr. Nilinton mentioned, there are ways to work around and there are a lot of active CSO working skillfully inside the countries. And we may be able to link the international donors to those CSO, we can be as a kind of a bridge uh, between the country and other organizations. And we are also very honored to share these experiences with the international uh, people. And we are very happy that you invited us this for the response to the first question. The second question is about hope. I am really pessimistic amid all the crisis because there are a lot of civil linings. The first thing is that it is so clear that pe people become so united after the coup. Of course, there are a lot of arguments, a lot of ideological fights on the social media, and there are a lot of social divisions between CDM, non-CDM, a lot of on-ground crisis and killings. But having said that, people are evolving into a new generation. They started to talk about Rohingya crisis. They started to talk about um, gender equality. So if 
there is some kind of human rights abuses, majority of people now step forward. Previously, I didn't see such kind of uh, narratives in the later generation or older generation in my country. But I would say that these are very bad signs that the country is moving forward ideologically amid the crisis. And the second civil lining is the reconciliation between the ethnic minorities and majority Burmese people. Now the Burmese people started to say that, gosh, there are a lot of troubles going on in these areas. We didn't know that we are very sorry, we apologize to you. Such kind of narratives are very prevalent in the social media, in the talks, in the seminars. And I am really hopeful that we could become unite after finishing with the coup or the military oppression. So that is one kind of hope for me. And the third hope for me is the resilience of Burmese people. I can imagine the trouble that they are facing. I can imagine the oppressions and everything else that they are facing because I'm outside the country and I feel guilty, of course, but then I can't stop admiring them. Whenever I talk to my friend inside the field, he has to encourage me. She has to tell me that everything is fine. Don't worry, don't depress. We are doing the best. So they have really a very good resilience and they are trying their best. Of course, there will be episodes of depression, but they don't give up. So I think amid the crisis, such kind of resi resilience level is shown. So that's very hopeful that the country is not into the downwards, downward spiral. The country is actually looking forward to a better future. After all, the whole revolution is about justice. The whole revolution is about human rights. The whole revolution is about uh, equality. So I really think that these won't be wasted and we will build a better nation. It may take time, but I'm so ho hopeful that we will do this one day. Thank you both so much for sharing your expertise and your eloquence with us about this very difficult situation, but also for sharing the hope for the future. We really appreciate your sharing your time with us today. Thank you also to our many listeners. And thank you to my wonderful colleague, Lisa Lee, for putting together all of our webinars this year. Again, thank you both so much, Dr. Pinza and Dr. Nelington. Take care and good evening or good morning. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you so much.